graphs of exponential functions a little bit today. Um, you will need to eventually get back into Canvas. There's a little link there that I have that we'll look at in just a moment. Okay. Um, the first thing that we need to look at are the effects of the parameters. Your parameters of this function are the values of a and b. Okay. And what does that value of a tell us in our exponential function? Initial. Yeah, this is our initial value. What? I think of the part after initial, that's why I kind of just stopped. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then what does the value of b tell us, or what is the value of b? Amber? The growth rate? Um, close. It's the growth factor. Okay, so what I want us to look at is how changing those parameters affects the graph of the function. So if you get back into Canvas, if you click on you click on that graph, it's actually a link, which will take you to a website, hopefully. I've never used it before, but hopefully it takes you to where you need to go. Okay, is it taking you to something like this? Okay, good. So all this is, you can see in the top row, I have a, b to the x, so basically just our basic exponential function. And then what you have below are what we call sliders. So what you can do is you can slide those along, and you can see as you change your value of b, what happens to your graph in both the positive and the negative directions. You can also change, using that slider, your value of A. So just take, I don't know, one minute or so to kind of play around. I believe that you can still I don't know if it'll let you do this. If you go to that little wrench up in the right-hand corner, I think you can change your grid if you want, but just kind of play around with those sliders. See how changing those values affects your graph. Mike, what happens when we change that value of A in terms of the graph? It uh, changes the uh, functionality of the uh, term. It does, actually. Okay, so... For what values of A is your graph concave up? And then when A is less than zero, your graph is concave down, okay? What else can we say? That this does. That's certainly correct. I like that one, actually. Of your art? Uh, not yet. That's the other one. <laughs> Changing that value of A changes what in terms of the graph? Haley? It changes your y intercept. Yeah, it changes the y intercept.
But like Mike said, changing that y-intercept then does have effects on the concavity of the graph. That is really excellent that you were thinking about that. Okay, now if we think about how changing that value of b affected the graph, Mike, this is where changing that value of b affects the steepness of the graph. Okay, the next thing that we are going to look at with exponential functions are horizontal asymptotes, okay, horizontal asymptotes. We've talked a little bit about what asymptotes are. You talked about it in Algebra 2. These are lines that graphs approach but never reach, yes? And we've seen them. We've talked about them, especially with, like, domain and range. In general, for your exponential function, f of x equals a, b to the x, the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote because f of x approaches zero as x gets large in either the positive or the negative direction. So here's what I mean by this. Let's look at it in terms of exponential growth. As your values, and this is what we call, um, oh my gosh, it just left my brain what kind of notation this is. It'll have to come back to me. Anyway. As our x values approach negative infinity, that's what this is saying, as your x values approach negative infinity, so along your x-axis, as our x values get more and more negative, our values of the function approach zero. So if you look, start over here when the x values are positive. Your y values are way up here. As we approach the negative x values, what happens to the y values? They get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is going to continue. So as I continue going to negative numbers on my x-axis, those y values are going to get increasingly closer and closer and closer to zero, but never actually cross it, okay? So that x-axis or y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote. We can look at the same thing for exponential decay. In this case, as x approaches positive infinity, so as our x values get closer and closer, bigger negatives, those y values or those function values get smaller and approach zero, okay? Now, the x-axis is not the only horizontal asymptote that you will have. In general, y equals k is a horizontal asymptote. k is just there. That's some number. Okay. y equals k is a horizontal asymptote if the function f... Hang on. Does this make sense? y equals k is a horizontal asymptote of the function if the function values get close to that number as x either, either goes way, way positive or way, way negative. Wow. Okay. Let me say that all one more time. So let's say um, we have 2 here. Let's say that uh, 
This is our graph. So in this case, as x gets bigger, sorry, smaller, as x approaches negative infinity, as x gets closer to those negative x numbers, your y values are getting closer to what? Two. Yeah, two. right. F of x approaches 2. That means y equals 2 would be a horizontal asymptote. So this is a lot of fancy words for saying if your y values keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer to a value, then y equals that value is your horizontal asymptote. Okay. All right. The last thing that we are going to look at, actually we've done a little bit already, so this might feel a little familiar to you. We are going to solve some exponential equations graphically. It says that we are often, often interested in solving equations involving exponential functions. Like I've mentioned for now, we will do this graphically but uh, next unit we will solve similar types of equations using logs, okay? So if we look at the first example, it says a 200 gram sample of carbon-14 decays according to that given formula, where T is in thousands of years. We want to estimate when there are 25 grams of carbon-14 left. So we are going to use that given exponential function. And I want to know when the quantity of my sample, in this case of carbon-14, when my sample has 25 in it. So here's what we can do with our calculators. I'm going to go to my y equals and I'm going to go ahead and plug in the exponential function. And then I'm also going to graph y equals 25. That is just going to give me a horizontal line through 25. And then go ahead and hit zoom zero, which is your zoom fit. And it will fit your graph pretty well to the window. But we have a little bit of a problem here. What's the problem? Well, the 25, I think, is way down here. What I'm concerned with is where those two lines intersect. And we can't see the intersection. So let's think about this logically. This exponential function is decreasing. So eventually over here somewhere is where they're going to intersect, right? So if you go to your window, let's increase, let's increase the x values that we're showing. So I don't know, let's say 15 and see if that works. It might not. Oh, that's close. You want to try like 20? You know what I also want to do? I want to change the minimum y value that I have because it's putting that 25 as the absolute minimum. But let's put some space under that. And I don't think we necessarily need to go all the way up to 350. So part of this is you guys understanding your calculators, understanding how changing your viewing window affects what you see, obviously. 
this is almost something that I can't really teach. Like, it's just almost something like you have to practice and figure out how your calculator works and how changing certain values in your calculator changes your viewing window. I mean, I'll help you, but it's almost just something like, I don't know. So anyway, I finally see where they're intersecting. I'd like to get a closer picture of that. So what I'm going to do now is zoom in. And if you see that little cross hatch, I'm going to move that to be over about where they're intersecting. And then when I hit enter, it'll zoom in right there. So hopefully now I'm getting, okay, a much, much better picture of where those two lines are intersecting. Okay. Then what I can do is second calc and actually calculate the exact intersection. So second calc will go to intersect. It's asking for you to pick a place on the first curve. All you need to do is hit enter. It's now asking you to pick a place on the second curve, hit enter. And now it's asking you to guess where you think the intersection is. Hit enter, then your calculator will calculate the actual intersection point. So when there are 25, what is it, grams, I guess, your x value is 17.18, or I guess t. That's fine, yeah. And this is, notice your question, estimate. This is definitely an estimation. Okay, so absolutely. What? Second calc, and then number five is intersect. And then it will ask you for a point on the first curve, hit enter, second curve, hit enter, and then where you think the guess is, enter, okay? Um, so 17.18 or 17.2, in terms of this problem, how many years is that? What? Exactly, because you're told that T is in thousands of years. So this is about 17,180 years. We should say after that many years, there will be 25 grams left. You could also still use your table like we did on that warm up. So using your table, you can still get a good idea. So between 17 and 18 is where we hit the 25. Just using the graph and having your calculator calculate that intersection is just going to give you a better answer. So anyway. All right, last one. It says the Earth's atmospheric pressure, P, in terms of height above sea level, is often modeled by an exponential decay function. It says the pressure at sea level, so at what height is that? Mm -hmm. So when your height is zero, you have 1,013 millibars and the pressure decreases by 14% for every kilometer above sea level. So let's first start off, before we even try to answer this question, let's first start off by writing the function to model this. So in general, P for pressure is going to be our general A times B to the T. What's our initial? Yeah, 
1013. And what is our growth factor? Right. We're decreasing by 14%. So 100 minus 14% is 86. And then as a decimal, that's 0.86. So now that we have a function, now how can we find the pressure at 50 kilometers above sea level? Don't overthink this. Yeah, I'll just plug it into T. Oops. I'm getting 0 0.5377, this would be millibars, whatever that is. Is that something you've heard of? Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's a real thing. I'm sure it is. Okay, so now more to what we are looking at today. This is, we've done this before. Estimate the altitude H at which the pressure equals 900 millibars. So I want to know when the pressure is equal to 900. So using your function, using what you want P to equal, let's plug these into our calculator and find the intersection. I would start by going zoom fit. That will at least give you a starting place for, that will at least give you a starting place. This is not a good starting place though, is it? And that's better. So I had to go back to Zoom standard for some reason, and then I did Zoom fit again, and it turned out a little bit better. So I'm then going to zoom in, where's my cursor, there it is. I'm now going to zoom in around where I'm seeing those two lines, or the two graphs intersect. And then I'm going to have my calculator calculate the intersection point. So second calc number five is intersect. So it's asking the first curve, just hit enter. It's asking the second curve, hit enter. Then it's asking you to guess, hit enter. And then it will calculate the intersection point. So I'm seeing that they're intersecting when x is equal to 0.784. There's no right ball. I like 0.78 or 2 or something like that. Yes. Okay, so I just do it by the table. Oh. Is that right? I would prefer you know how to do it this way too. So come see me on Monday in AL if you need calculator help. Okay. So this is saying at a height of 0 0.784 uh, kilometers above sea level, the pressure 900 <coughs> millibars.